This is the sixth and final portion of the lecture on imaging of the eye in orbit. Diseases of the paranasal sinus will often secondarily affect the orbit, usually from mass effect. So let's just run through this list of diagnoses. A mucosal is what happens when you obstruct a sinus or a portion of the sinus and the mucus um, accumulates within it and expands that sinus. This is a mucosal of the frontal sinus and you can see it pressing down on the roof of the orbit. You can imagine the mass effect that that would have and this patient will present with exophthalmos. You might look at this image and say, wow, that's a really aggressive tumor. It is destroying the medial uh, fat of the orbit. It's encompassed the extraocular muscles. It's up uh, against the globe itself, having destroyed all of these uh, orbital contents. What an aggressive neoplasm. And that is exactly what it looks like. But this is a mimic of neoplasm. This is invasive fungal sinusitis. And that's a really important concept, that invasive fungal sinusitis looks just like a tumor. Um, and and is very aggressive and has a very poor prognosis. Um, but this is invasive fungal sinusitis secondarily involving the orbit. This is an example of a, an actual neoplasm secondarily involving the orbit. You can see this enhanced, heterogeneously enhancing mass is pushing on the orbital contents. It's not really invading the way that fungal case was showing invasion. It's just pushing things out of the way. Uh, this is metastatic disease, I believe, from a lung primary. Newest sinus dilatans is an odd disease. It looks a lot like a mucosal would look with expansion of the walls of the sinus uh, and a spherical configuration to the sinus, but instead of being filled with mucus, this sinus is filled with air. Uh, presumably this is some sort of ball valve effect uh, that is causing the sinus to dilate. You can imagine that this has mass effect upon the orbit in the same way that a mucosal would. Pneumosinus dilatans. What happens when any air cell is chronically infected? Well, the walls of the air cell will thicken and the walls of the air cell will retract. Chronic inflammation draws in the walls of a sinus. This is true in the mastoid air cells where, the, where those air cells will completely disappear. This is true in the maxillary sinuses as well where all the walls of the sinus will seem to cave in. This is particularly important when one of the walls that's caving in is the floor of the orbit. You can see on the unaffected side what the normal configuration of the orbital floor should be. And you can see on the affected side how it has been drawn down. This artificially increases the volume of the orbit. The eyeball falls back and you get enophthalmos. Enophthalmos as a result of chronic sinusitis and retraction of the orbital floor is called the silent sinus syndrome. Uh, that's what this is, the silent sinus syndrome, and you can make that diagnosis easily on CT. All right, let's move on to trauma of the orbit. We've talked previously about trauma of the globe, but now let's focus on the orbit. There are some classic fractures of the orbit, including trapdoor fractures and blowout fractures. Uh, those are covered in greater detail in the facial fracture lecture, but we will briefly discuss them here. There are two types of hematoma that we can encounter in the orbital soft tissue. We can get the classic mass-like hematoma. It's shaped like a fist and it's just sitting there, a ball of clot, sure. But there's another form of hematoma, a strandy form, in which the hematoma tracks along the fascial planes of the, uh, of the orbit, and, um, and it just looks like inflammation, but it's actually hematoma. And then, of course, foreign bodies in the orbit, just like foreign bodies in the eye itself. Here's an example of a blowout fracture. You can see there's herniation of orbital contents. I will remind you that entrapment is a clinical diagnosis. We don't make that diagnosis uh, on radiology, but we can make a diagnosis of herniation of orbital contents through a fracture floor. Uh, for more details, please see the lecture on facial fractures. This is an example of the strandy form of orbital hematoma. Does this look like inflammation? Absolutely. Does it look just like that case of diffuse pseudotumor that I showed a few slides ago? It absolutely does. Of course, the clinical history entirely different in this case. Um, this is uh, from trauma to the eye.
this the quantity of blood that is represented by an infiltrative hematoma can be massive and you can get extensive enophthalmos without a focal mass which might be confusing you've got to remember to add up all of the volume of this rather rather large infiltrative hematoma to understand why the globe has been pushed out so far so we've already talked about foreign bodies and what they look like. This is sort of a pop quiz on, on, on foreign bodies here. What we see is there's a foreign body underneath the left globe, and centrally there's a very dense uh, material, but then peripherally there's very lucent material. What might this be? I'll give you a second to think about it. What might this be? Perhaps it's more evident in the axial plane where you can see more clearly the shape of this object. There is a long linear hyperdense uh, object down the center and, um, uh, and lucent material surrounding it sharpened to a point. That lucent material is wood. Remember, wood is uh, radiolucent. And the dense material is the graphite from carbon down the center of a pencil. I'm wondering how mad this person's uh, friend had to get to stab them in the eye with a pencil and then snap it off, uh, but that is in fact what this foreign body is. Let's take a few moments to round out the lecture with a discussion of dacrocystography. This is a disappearing technique, but it is occasionally very useful. Dacrocystography uses digital subtraction techniques in a, in a fluoroscopic environment, usually biplane techniques so that you only have to inject once on each eye, to evaluate the drainage system of the nasal lacrimal duct. This is a normal frontal projection dacrocystogram. You can see that the system has been cannulated with a 27 gauge Rabinov catheter through the inferior puncta. There you have a superior and inferior puncta on the upper and lower lids of the eye. Uh, this is about where the eyeball is and this is the other side and this is the nasal cavity here. You can see that there is a draining canaliculus, a superior and an inferior canaliculus extending medially. These often combine into a common canaliculus, but not in this patient. And then they dump into the nasolacrimal sac. From the nasolacrimal sac, material drains down through the nasolacrimal duct and dumps into the nasal cavity in the inferior meatus. When seen from the lateral projection, you can more clearly see the thickness of the nasolacrimal sac, and you can more clearly see where the material dumps into the uh, inferior meatus and drips back down into the nasopharynx. There are several normal areas of mild narrowing representing valves in the nasolacrimal duct. These each have their own names, um, which are beyond the scope of this lecture. The Contrast that is utilized to perform this examination is an oil-based contrast agent called ethiodol um, that has become difficult to obtain in the United States. This is an abnormal lateral projection of a dacrocystogram. You can see that the upper half of the nasolacrimal apparatus is dilated and it suddenly tapers down to a very narrow segment in the bottom half. This is scarring and stenosis of the nasolacrimal uh, duct with uh, prestenotic dilatation. This concludes the lecture series on imaging of the eye and orbit.